was told I have a bit minutes more. Never tell this to a researcher, that's dangerous. Never tell a researcher to talk more. Now I will try to keep on time with two of us. I was introduced already, um, so I will just start and give a brief insight on what do you see my hat? Now it's working. Um, on, on the idea of what we brought to you, because um, my, my perspective is that science has come up with great inventions and entrepreneurship turned those into amazing innovations. But both worlds are limited by diversity biases for years and decades costing us a lot of money and actually even costing lives. So therefore it's time, it's really time to harness the creative power of diversity in entrepreneurship. To cost less money and really to save lives. I'm a highly privileged person. It took me years to understand that. I'm suffering from biases. I'm highly suffering from diversity biases. And often I'm not even conscious about those. I have biases in the words I use. I have biases in the metaphors I use. I have biases how I treat people. And I do have biases in the research I do, how I see the world, how I see potential of what should be researched about. So the best thing to change biases or to work on your biases is through behavioral design. Make a difference. But to do though, you need to understand where you want to make the difference and you need to understand which is the best field to tackle diversity. So the highest bias I'm suffering from others is my gender. I'm often, often the first the first women in this commission, the first female founder doing this, the first female researcher doing this. And what I learned is it's hard to be the first alone. So I started to join up with others, to be together the first to tackle diversity issues. And what we are doing in our research is focusing on one aspect, which is gender and entrepreneurship. I'm doing this in innovation research, so more from the technology side to understand better what's the potential of different kinds of gender perspectives throughout the value proposition process, throughout the idea of how we come up with inventions and turn those innovations. And on the other side, I'm looking at people. I'm looking at identities. And I thought, okay, if I'm experiencing this, this has been a long term of research or getting going on on that. But actually, I learned that those roots of women's entrepreneurship research are quite young. And this is what I would like to talk about a bit, give you a brief introduction of what already happening in women's entrepreneurship. And Silke will give you some insights on recent ongoing research. So it's just one biased perspective we're looking into, but we're joining up and collaborating with other ideas of entrepreneurial diversity we should think of to lower our biases in what we do in practice and what we do in research. So I, I started up with the idea of germination, so the idea from starting with the seeds and adding up with a little, little flower plant where we're starting to work on when we talk about women's entrepreneurship. So putting down its first roots of awareness isn't that old. So the idea of at all entrepreneurship literature, so doing research about how people come up with ideas and turn those into innovation, isn't that old. It's from the 1930s where researchers started to think about it. And it took us 40 years. It took us 40 years until the first occurrence of the subdomain of women's entrepreneurship at all occurred. So it took us 40 years, a whole time of research where we only looked at a male centrist perspective, totally unconscious. I don't want to blame those researchers. I don't want to blame those colleagues. Actually, most of them have been male as well. But they lacked a whole potential. They lost a total perspective. So only in the end of the 70s, we had the first journal article at all looking at what is the new female frontier in entrepreneurship or at all in contemporary business. And it took us almost 10 years more until the first conference presentation took place. 
So it's not that many decades ago that we at first at all talked about the idea of it could be that female make a difference. And do you know when the 30% solution of the United Nations first and started to understand that 30% make a difference in decision boards? The first United Decisions board discussion on that was in the early 70s. So it has been out in political. It has been aware that there is a difference. But research took quite some time, being biased itself. So as a sprouting out as a new field of research, growing critics on the supposedly gender-neutral perspective grew more and more only in the 90s. So those male discourse that has been said to be gender neutral started to be criticized roughly only 30 years ago. So at least I was born there 10 years ago, honestly. But it took me 30 years, it took them 30 years to understand that there's not only an issue and that it has been proven that it makes a difference, that gender makes a difference when we look at hindrances and potentials in society to understand better who is doing those inventions. And the exploitation, exploration of the need to investigate differences in the category of sex and gender only started in this century. So only in the late 2000s, they started to understand that it makes a difference if I look at the biological sex, or the social construction of gender. So only through that time, research started to look at those differences in the category. If I look at if it do has a biological effect, or does it make a difference how we treat, how we look at other, how these unconscious biases do make a difference if we do business. And if we do at look at innovations that might change and will change society. So in the late 80s, the first academic book arrived, and in 1998, the first policy-oriented conferences on women's entrepreneurship took place. That's roughly 20 years ago. Roughly 20 years ago, and more than 60 years after entrepreneurship research started, we started to understand a bit better There's the whole field of research that has been ignored that we had a huge unconscious bias that missed out potential of how we could better understand what we do when we do entrepreneurship, how we can change the world. Everyone is asking and, and pleading for more entrepreneurs, but who are those people? And it's not only a question of gender, I would like to say again, but those are the perspectives I can bring you in today. So growing leaves to nourish perspective has been the next step in the last, I would say, 15 years. Leading to mainstream entrepreneurship um, journals starting to recognize this research gap. Often criticizing that there's a gap, but then just researching gender as a variable. So just controlling actually on sex, if sex makes a difference, but not putting it into mainstream research. Actually, it is still today a road less traveled. So the rise of special entrepreneurship ecosystem reports on women's entrepreneurship made more and more a conscious field out of this. So transparency by numbers needed more and more insights on why this is. So we learned more about the what it is. We do got more information about that we do have a gap, but we still lack information on why we have this gap. So the first academic conference on women's entrepreneurship has been held in 2003, going on with better understanding the why do we have this guest. And the first dedicated journal has been launched only 10 years ago. So we're still more and more into the idea, what is the difference? Actually having a challenge if we look at numbers, because they do have different methods and they do look at a different perspective. What we really mean when we look at women's entrepreneurship, do we mean all founders? Do we mean people that are just self-employed? Do we mean people that start up in a special field dedicated to support women? Or do we look at all those that just have the idea to change the world? So if we talk about women's entrepreneurship, it's still a huge field we need to understand better. We still need to work on our unconscious biases on that. So, for 
This is what's going on. It's budding for scientific consciousness. It's about the genderedness we talk about, the doing and undoing of gender throughout the entrepreneurship and innovation process. The little, little battles we fight in ourselves when we start to understand, am I an entrepreneur? And does it make a difference of who am I? Ending up when we look at how does what I do, the value proposition I bring in, do have gender aspects. So from ideas over inventions, innovations, to the intention to become an entrepreneur, to investment decisions, because we still ask men to win and women not to lose, as one of the highly published articles is titled. We do have a different perspective in investment still, so we know that we do fund them differently, and we know it, it recently learned just why, because we asked them different questions. So we do learn more about the international ecosystem, so there's a lot of work to do on this perspective. So what will be the next first? The first journal that will publish a real gender paper. The first conference we will make it a main topic to talk about not only gender but diversity. Who will be the first highly funded grant that will have a distinct focus on women's entrepreneurship. So it's time to blossom. It's time to blossom to nurture the diversity of entrepreneur species because it's not only women it's entrepreneur species but they are one of them we need to research and what we've been done and what's doing and going on Zika can tell us a little bit more about thank you Steffi yeah before I start to give you yeah a very brief introduction into two of my recent works on this. I just wanted to introduce you to the little pictures that I used. Uh, that's a little analogy from biology. There is a great beauty in diversity of colors and shapes in nature. We have more than one million different species of insects, and they live on a huge diversity of plants. So I used this little picture here. There is a diverse, or there are diverse motivations for entrepreneurial activity. Not only the motivation to maximize income makes entrepreneurs jacks and jacklins of all trades. That is one recent work that I did together with colleagues where we actually tested a theory of entrepreneurship that was proposed by Edward Lazier. And his assumption is that we all, in our work life, want to maximize our lifetime income. And he argues that generalists, so people with a more balanced set of experiences and skills and knowledge, can do that better through being entrepreneurs. While specialists or experts can do that better with a position in employment. We argue that women have other motivations to start businesses than to maximize their lifetime income. One very important one we have heard already this morning from Carolina. She said to us, I'm doing what I love to do. So for sure, self-fulfillment is a very important motivation. It can also be helping others, it can be family duties, and lots of more non-monetary motivations to start businesses. However, what we proved with our study is that Lazier's hypothesis holds true for these cases as well. So women uh, entrepreneurs are Jacqueline's of all trades. What we did is we tested that with a representative sample of about 1,400 female graduates, actually, in Germany. And we used several indicators that show a balanced, where this is a specialized skill set and experience. And I have one more here. 
While we ought to celebrate diversity in entrepreneurship, the stereotype of entrepreneurs remains male. Female characteristics are not perceived as entrepreneurial. So as we have heard a lot already this morning, the typical entrepreneur is connected to a certain mindset. For example, that the entrepreneur is innovative. But one more, or one very important influential characteristic is being male. Males are seen as the norm, there is a very strong masculine stereotype and also invisible masculinity. What we did is we wanted to know, is this really still the case? Is it this the case in our young generation? And actually we did a quantitative test. We had eight, uh, 86 German students filling out a questionnaire for that. And actually we gave them a free field to comment on that. And they commented that, you know, they even didn't want to be asked that question, that this is kind of, you know, old fashioned thinking. Why are we coming up with that? But then we gave them a list of adjectives or short descriptions of people. That's the so-called shine descriptive index. With a lot of items actually, 92 items. So it can be something like uh, independent, innovative, strong, timid, shy. So it's a, a long list. Uh, and what we found was actually they, they filled in what do you think an entrepreneur is like, what do you think either a woman is like or a man is like, that was randomly. And what we found was that there is a high congruence still among the young generation between entrepreneurs and men. And what we mostly found was that they share the untypical characteristics. So what is not typical for an entrepreneur is also not typical for a man. Regarding female characteristics and entrepreneurs, there was simply no congruence, so they were simply not linked at all. And this was even the case when we used explicit notions, that means that we really ask them, are you thinking of a woman entrepreneur now or a male, so a female or a male entrepreneur? Uh, and we still could not find a link. The only link that we found, and I think this is an interesting and important part, uh, is that there was a higher and significant relation between female and entrepreneurial characteristics in the case that the participants had self-employed persons in their direct surroundings. So it seems that that makes a difference. It's actually the role model argument. And related to these results and also a bit my general thoughts uh, on gender and entrepreneurship, I have come up with a few claims to finish our presentation. First, to encourage women's entrepreneurship, we need to say more yes and instead of yes but. We should attach more importance to the emancipatory process of women becoming entrepreneurs. And part of the dilemma, and we have also heard this, I think also from Carolina this morning, is that we discuss women's entrepreneurship but not men's entrepreneurship. I've never heard that. And Carolina's argument was we should even not distinguish between that as all. Entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship. And neither patriarchy nor matriarchy is the economic system of the future. However, to reach full gender equality, sustainable growth and social values, we need to add feminine values to the economic system. And the last one actually is the role model argument. You cannot be what you cannot see. We need to make women entrepreneurs, and that includes those with STEM, or in Germany we discuss the MINT Fächer, MINT background. We should make them, we should show them and make them more visible to get more of them. Thank you. <laughs>